Everybody, what's going on? This is Isaac Curry tag teaming again with my brother Jerry Flowers. For a moment, really quickly, let's show some love to our pastors, Tanisha and Jerry Flowers. Let's show them how we feel about them on today. Yes, it's it. It's Isaac Curry once again, but I'm so excited to be able to be here with my brother and my sister and my family. You are a part of the family. You invited me back one more time, and guess what? That means we're family. I'm excited about tonight. I don't know what you're expecting, but you need to expect great things because I promise you some transformation is going to happen tonight. I have my oil because this is an oily word. If you have some oil, I need you to pause and I need you to go ahead and pour it out. Pour it on your ears, pour it on your eyes because I promise you God has a word for you on today. Listen, I'm just going to give you the title already. This is the title of today's message. When the devil sends a counterfeit. When the devil sends a counterfeit. A counterfeit opportunity. A counterfeit job. A counterfeit business venture. A counterfeit relationship. I said it. A relationship. A counterfeit friend. What do you do when you're face to face with something that God did not send? Somebody type it. God didn't send that. God did not send that. God did not send that. And I want to help provide you some principles that will help you in your life when it comes to discernment, because discernment is one of the critical features, one of the critical weapons that you have in your arsenal. And I want to make sure that you're operating as a believer with healthy discernment. But in order to do that, I have to call your attention to the book of Nehemiah. The word is oily, so I don't want you to, don't disengage because what God has for you, I need you to tune in. As a matter of fact, I need you to lean in on today because we're, we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter six, chapter six, verses 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. I'm just gonna throw in verse 15 and 16. Nehemiah chapter six, verse 10, when the devil sends a counterfeit, foundational principles for discernment. Somebody type again, God didn't send that. Read with me. It says afterward, now this is Nehemiah talking, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, and it says who was a secret informer. Somebody say he was a secret informer. He was a secret informer. Here's here's the thing. Let me let me just pause because I'm excited. He says he's in a, he's a secret informer, which means nobody gave Nehemiah this information because Nehemiah is able to discern the way he's able to discern. He is now unraveling spiritual conspiracies because his level of discernment is so high. Unpause. It says and he said, let us meet together in the house of God. This is what the secret informer is saying to Nehemiah. And it says, within the temple, and let us close the doors to the temple, for they're coming to kill you, Nehemiah. Indeed, at night, they're going to come and kill you. But I replied, Nehemiah says, I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? He says, should someone in my position enter into the temple to save his own life? He says, no this is what Nehemiah says to the secret informer, which you don't know is a former friend. It's a friend right now. He's saying to his friend, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And then it says in verse 12, this is, where, this is where it gets thick. He says, I perceive, Nehemiah says, I perceive, somebody say discern, somebody say discern, somebody type discern. He says, I discerned that God not, had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah, somebody say the adversary, Tobiah and Sanballat had hired my friend. My friend came to me and said, let's go to the church because the people want to get you and we'll be protected in the church and let's lock the doors. And he said, no, 
You may be my friend. You may be familiar. You, I may have met you in church. I'm trying to help somebody already. And he says, no, no, I perceived, I discerned that God wasn't in that, that God did not send him to me. Somebody say, God didn't send that. And it says in verse 13, for this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act in a, a, a fearful way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they may bring against me. He is understanding Nehemiah, the purpose in which the people who had come to him and are pretending to be on his side and pretending to be God's sins, but he understands that they're counterfeits. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to preach out. I, I wish you all were right here right now. It says in verse 14, my God, now he's beginning to pray on behalf of those adversaries, on behalf of those people who said that they were coming on, on, on behalf of God. He says, my God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to their works and the prophetess. And the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have me afraid. If I've lost you, just know that you got a whole lot of people in the church who are counterfeits. I'm looking at the text. A whole lot of people in the temple, the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have me to be afraid. You didn't send them, God. And they, they are counterfeits. He has the courage. Nehemiah has the level of discernment where he's able to determine, I know it looks good. I know it sounds good. But God didn't send that. Somebody said God didn't send that. So on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we begun, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized that the work that had been done had been because God had helped us. Somebody type amen. <laughs> when the devil sends you a counterfeit, God didn't send that, Nehemiah said. But I want to talk to you about some principles of discernment, right? It's important that I, I talk to you about this, but let me just pause. Let me verify and validate some things with you. At the end of 2020, what most people don't know, some of you do know, I got married to my beautiful wife. Amen, somebody. And at the end of the pandemic, 2020, I get married to my beautiful wife. We're, we're now about six months into this thing, but I know you give me congratulations. We appreciate it. I appreciate it definitely, but I want to slow you down. I want to slow you down before you give me the kudos. Just know it took eight long years back and forth, break up, get back together, trying to make this thing work eight long years before we finally arrived to a place in which I had the awareness and the, the courage, the confidence to be able to propose and say, I want you to be, I, I want you to be my wife. But hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The reason why this is important because one of the, the most, one of the most difficult things you'll be able to do or try to do in your life is to try to, to, to discern God's will for you when it comes to marriage. And, and to make matters a little more, you know, thick, see, my wife knew when she tells the story, she'll tell you, God told me that you were my, my, my husband. But see, for me, because we're talking about discernment, I just want to, for me, God told her that I was her husband, but for me, I, I was trying to discern because I, I didn't quite hear God and I, and I need to know for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure before I make that decision. And, and I, sent, I spent so much time in indecision trying to discover, is this God's voice? Should I do this? Should I not do this? I don't know. What's going to happen? And I'm, 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 I'm asking people for help. What, what, what do you think? What do you think? And, and for eight years, back and forth, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm trying to indecision, trying to deal. What, what does discernment look like? How, oh, but see, Every level you enter into, discernment becomes 
far more difficult because you have more things at stake. You have more things at risk and you have a, a higher impact to, to impact other people. It's a higher probability that you will impact other people. But for eight years, we went back and forth until 2019, I spent 12 months fasting and praying, trying my best to hear and understand and see God because nobody was teaching me about discernment and I need to know about discernment. And so for 12 months, and then I, I, I even thought that I was supposed to go somewhere else and, and, and pursue someone else, but discernment kept me. Somebody say discernment will keep you. Discernment will keep you. Lo and behold, after 12 months of fasting and praying, when God spoke, then I knew. Yes, I proposed. But it was a long, painful journey because I had to learn about discernment. That's why I want to help you. I want to help you on today. But yes, I got married six months ago, right? But, but in, in addition to that, <laughs> I'm on a job after I get married. A job that I've been on for 10 years, a job uh, that pays the bill, the job that is lucrative, the job that has a 401k, a job that allows me to be comfortable. I'm on a job that pays well. But I discerned that the season was expiring or had already expired. And so because I discerned that the season had expired, I walked away from a job. A job that was lucrative, a job that had 401k, a job that had retirement, and people called me and my wife crazy. Walked away from a job only to not have a job. Somebody said, discernment did that? I walked away because I was, I realized I was in an expired season and I'm talking to somebody right now. You're sitting comfortable in a season that has been expired, but you don't want to step out, but I'm going to help you on today, right? And so I walk out on the job and people call us crazy because you don't know where you're going to get your, your, your next paycheck from. And then to make, to make matters worse, what I do is I turn down an opportunity for $300,000. I said hundred. I didn't say hundred. I said hundred. $300,000. An opportunity. And the reason why I turned down that job offer that ultimately would accrue $300,000 is because I discerned that just because a door is open doesn't mean you need to walk through it. I'm trying to help somebody. I, I, I am trying, I need you to lean in because we're going to get into this text and this text gets pretty oily, but I need you to understand. And so I turn down a good job, a good opportunity. And then what my wife and I do, we launch a ministry called Relationships Without Walls, right? And it's designed to help believers, to help Christians to do relationships better. Don't have any money, don't bring any money in, but I'm functioning off of discernment. Somebody say, you keep saying discernment, but what is discernment? Let me help you. Discernment is your ability to see the thing behind the thing. Did, did, maybe I need to say it again. What you need to understand is that discernment is your ability to see the thing that is behind that thing, right? But what you also need to understand that in the life of every single believer, discernment is absolutely critical. It is an essential weapon that should be in your arsenal. Healthy discernment. But that's not the only thing. Healthy discernment also needs good decision making. Every single believer, everyone who is listening right now, I'm getting into it, I'm getting into it, just, just, just follow me. You need healthy discernment and discernment is your ability to see the thing that is behind the thing and decision making is your ability to have sound judgment despite the circumstances. 
See, see, some of us are saying, Lord, give me good discernment. No, you need good discernment and you need good decision making because your discernment is your ability to see. But decision making is your ability to do with what you have seen. I see it. Now, what are you going to do with what you're able to see? Somebody say, I need to see, I need to see, but you also need good decision making. We're looking at a text that is absolutely important, but in order for us to understand and appreciate what Nehemiah does, we must understand that discernment is a gift that God gives us. And decision making is a skill that we accrue. But both your discernment and your decision making are things that need to be developed. Your discernment and your decision making are things that must be developed. Everything you do in your life is going to be based upon the decisions that you make. The quality of your life is going to be based upon the quality of your discernment. And some of us have very poor discernment. Some of us have very poor decision making, but here is a truth. You can be anointed and still be poor at making decisions. Poor decision making. You can have the power of God over your life and still be unable to make sound decisions. You can just ask Samson. Samson was anointed, but Samson didn't make good. He, he couldn't discern well. He had very poor discernment. He, he had the anointed. You, you have the anointing on your life, but your discernment is extremely poor. You can look at the disciples in Luke chapter 9. They have the power of God over their life. They were walking with Jesus. I'm walking with Jesus. But the moment somebody stepped on your toes, the moment somebody made you upset, the moment that someone made you angry, now I want to rain fire down from heaven. I want to burn everybody up. You can have the power of God on your life and still not make sound. Decisions. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help somebody in here today. Somebody say God didn't send that. God didn't send that. God didn't send that. God didn't send that. Why are we talking about Nehemiah and how are we going to look at Nehemiah and make it make sense when we begin to look at discernment? I need you to increase your discernment. I need your discernment to be healthy because you're about to enter into a season of your life where you need to be able to lean into your ability to see that that wasn't a God sin. He was not a God sin. I know he sounded well. I know you met him in church, but God did not send him. I know she looks good. She has everything you thought you wanted. But let me tell you something. God didn't, God didn't, God didn't send him. I didn't send her Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in the castle. He is in, he, he is a part of the king's leadership. Nehemiah is a cupbearer. Nehemiah is closest to the king when we find him in chapter one of Nehemiah. He is the cupbearer. He drinks from the cup that the king will drink from. As a matter of fact, he has a 401k. The money that he needs, he has because everything is secure. His life is secure. His retirement is secure. But he got word that his family and extended family and friends were in Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem had not been built. Why is that important? Why, why are we talking about the walls of Jerusalem? The walls of Jerusalem protected the entire city and more importantly, they protected the temple. And if the walls were not protecting and guarding the city from intruders and people on the outside, then you could not rebuild the temple. And in rebuilding the temple, you could not have a place of worship. And so it vexed his spirit in Nehemiah chapter one. And when he heard about this, can you believe that he does something crazy? He hears that his family is in trouble. He begins to pray to God. And the Bible even teaches that he begins to fast to God. And then he quits his job. He shifts careers. I'm talking about Nehemiah's getting paid money. 
and then he walks away from a lucrative job. The reason why I'm talking about this, you think I'm just talking about a relationship. No, I'm talking about your career. I'm talking about the ministry. I'm talking about every decision you need to make. Decision making is an absolute critical skill that you must understand that needs development. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm trying to help you on today. He leaves his job. He shifts careers, not because he wanted a promotion, he shipped careers, and now he's just going to become a kingdom builder. Somebody say, I need to be a kingdom builder. I need to be a kingdom builder before I am anything else. He becomes a kingdom builder, and he has no promise for income. But he understood it was time to shift because his season expired. And then he prayed to God. And after praying to God, he made a critical decision. It's time for me to leave this job. I discern it's time for me to leave this job because it's somewhere else God is calling me. And now he enters into a new career. But what's most powerful is that he ends up finding the right people to surround himself. But when you look at Nehemiah chapter 6, what we discover is the wall to Jerusalem is not only rebuilt, but it's rebuilt in record timing, somebody say supernatural miracles. Supernatural miracles occur at the hands of Nehemiah because it was the result of his discernment and his decision making. But although he had good discernment and although he made some good decisions, he also had some adversaries and his situation, his context, his circumstances were not necessarily favorable. Yes, it's easy to make good decisions when you have nothing to risk. It's easy to make sound decisions and to walk in discernment when ain't nobody going to be mad at you as a result of the decision that you make. But he leaves his job, he goes to Jerusalem, and as a result, we fast forward, he rebuilds the entire temple or the, the, the entire walls around Jerusalem. Somebody say, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Mm, mm. Think about this. He's able to rebuild these walls all around Jerusalem. He's able to experience God move in a way that he had not experienced God to move before. Somebody here needs a miracle. Somebody wants to hear God's voice. I know you're praying at night. Lord, should I make this decision? Is this the man I need to get married to? Should I say yes? I know it's a man saying, God, look, we've been dating. I don't know. He's, God's probably already given you the answer, but you keep answering, asking because you want God to change his answer. I'm going to keep on preaching. I'm not going to even focus on that, right? Some of us, many of us, are asking God, we, we, what do I do? How do I shift? Should I move to a new city? Should I stop what I'm doing? God, what should I do? You're waiting. You don't hear any answers. You want God to speak to you audibly. God, I see how you spoke to Pastor Isaac. I see how you spoke to my friend down the street. God, I want you to speak to me the way you spoke to everybody else. I know, we're praying. God, what should I, should I take this job? Should I stay at this job? I don't like this job, but should I come over here? Oh God, God, what should I do? Somebody say, I need discernment. I need discernment. When the devil sends a counterfeit, what do you mean? Because now that Nehemiah is just about to finish building the walls, then the same people who was on his squad, the same people who was on his team, some of the adversaries, Sambal and Tobias, they had convinced them, we need to kill Nehemiah. See, here's the thing. The devil does not want you to have a healthy discernment. The devil does not want you to make healthy decisions. So the devil will do whatever he can do just so you can be confused. And so what he does, Sanballat and Tobiah, what they do is they hire, they convince these people who were once rolling with Nehemiah. Hey, we'll give you this if you can just lure Nehemiah into the temple. Because if he gets into the temple, then we can take care. We can kill him. Nehemiah, they come to Nehemiah because what they had already been doing, they'd already been sending, they've been gossiping and spreading rumors and Nehemiah was not coming down from the wall. 
He said, I'm not coming down. I'm not going to address your rumors. God will fight my battles. I got something too more. It's too much. It's too, I got too many things to do that are too, that are much more important. Then what I need to do is keep focusing on what God has called me to do. They come. And he says, no, this one prophet comes to Nehemiah. And this is where it gets good. Hey, Nehemiah, um, I heard some people are going to come and kill you. So let's go to the temple so we can be protected. Nehemiah looks. And here's my question. How does Nehemiah know that God didn't send him? How does Nehemiah know that this was a fraud? This was a counterfeit. This was an imposter. Let me give you a few things that you need to apply to your life to make sure you're able to discern whether or not that's a counterfeit or whether or not this is a God sin. Number one. Somebody type word level, word level, word level. If you want to make sure, just like Nehemiah, that you're operating with good discernment, look at your word level, your word level, your word bank, because you cannot have good discernment with a low word level. What do you mean, low word level? I can't even. If you look at Nehemiah chapter one, verse seven, when Nehemiah discovered that his family and friends were in Jerusalem and things were falling apart, you know the first thing he did? He started praying. No, no, listen, listen, listen. He didn't just start praying, Lord, help me. God, I need you to help. I need you to open the door. God, what should I do? He said, no, he started praying. He said, God, according to your word, you said that if we, if we turn away from you, then you will scatter us. But God, according to your word in Deuteronomy chapter 30, you also said that if we return to you, you will bring us back into yourself. God, we want to come back to you. God, this is what your word said. I'm trying to help. You can't have good discernment if you don't know God's word. You can't know which decisions to make if you're avoiding reading what God already said. I'm, I, I, I just want to throw my computer at you. Listen, somebody say low word level, low word level. In order to make sure that your discernment is on fleek, in order to make sure that your discernment is what it needs to be, you need to increase the word of God in your life. But no, don't, don't, don't let me miss you. What we desire is to ask God a question and we want God to answer us audibly. God, we want an encounter with you. Give us a vision. Let me hear your voice. What do you have to say about this decision in my life? Let me help you. God speaks two ways, his word, two ways, audible and written. God speaks to us audibly and through his written word, audible word, written word. We see God often in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in which he responds to Daniel. He responds to Abraham. He responds to many people audibly, and we say we want that, but don't miss, don't, don't miss something. God has given us a written word. His written word is the word of God. Don't, don't miss you. When you put God in a box, and say, God, I need you to respond to me because I hadn't, I hadn't heard your voice. God is saying, well, why is it that you make my audible voice more important than my written word? Because both of them are my word. So I've spoken in a word, and if you don't read my word, but yet you want me to speak to you audibly, then why would I trust you with my audible word if, you, if I can't trust you with my written word? Some of us are asking God some questions and the answers are already written. God said, go back to my word. The problem is your word bank is deficient. The problem is your word bank is too low, insufficient funds. And what I need, I need you to make a commitment on today. Uh-uh. I'm going to spend some time in God's word because there's something in God's word that will speak to me. God, what Nehemiah did, we can look at the wall, but what I need you to understand, he looked at the word and he was able to say, God, this is what your word said. 
And so I am bringing your word back into you because your word would not return to you void. That's what your Bible says. And so what I want to encourage you on today is to make sure that your word level isn't too low. But the second thing is not only when you're thinking about discernment, because much of our discernment can be satisfied by the word that's in us. The second thing is your atmosphere. Somebody say your atmosphere. Your atmosphere. I'm going to try to do this quick because I got to get out of your way. Your atmosphere. Your atmosphere. Not only is it your word level, but it's also your atmosphere. Not in chapter one, but in chapter two. Let me tell you something that happens that's so profound. Around about verse 12, after he, Nehemiah, got permission from God to leave where he was to now go to Jerusalem, the Bible teaches us. In chapter 2, that he goes to Jerusalem and he tells no one what God had told him. He was silent for a season in which he didn't talk to people and he didn't allow people to talk and, and enter into his ears and to confuse them with their opinions. There's a season in his life in which it was just him and God. I don't need too many people in my atmosphere that will distort what God is saying, what God is trying to do. So I'm going to be quiet. And the Bible emphasizes to us in chapter two that I didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. He went to Jerusalem and he looked over everything. He took a step back and he assessed everything before he made decisions. He was slow to make decisions. And why he was slow? Because God could speak again. And I want to make sure that I don't allow too many people's opinions to take what God might speak to me. I remember when, when, when Jerry, Jerry said something about when you're laying foundation of concrete, you want to make sure that you don't allow too many people access to you. Because if too many people have access to you when you're laying the foundation of concrete, when the concrete dries and everybody leaves, you're still left with their impressions. Oh, that'll preach. Act like that just came from me. That just came from me. Yeah, that, that, that's just powerful. Nehemiah shh, doesn't say anything. He's responsible for his atmosphere. Some of us are asking too many more people for their opinions when you haven't even sat in God's presence. Lord, what do you have to say? And if I don't hear it, let me read it. Let me read your word. And, and perhaps you may not speak to me audibly, but I somewhere in your word. Not just your, your, your word level, but it's your atmosphere, right? You have to be responsible for your atmosphere. And here, here's a third, here's a third one, here's a third one, here's a third one. I need somebody to type your emotional hygiene. Emotional hygiene. When we're thinking about discernment, it is absolutely critical that you're mindful of your word level it's absolutely essential that you are responsible for your atmosphere. What's around you? Who's around you? Right? But you also must be responsible, must be responsible for your emotional hygiene. The Bible teaches us in chapter 6, verse 13, what we read is that Nehemiah said, No. I'm not going to respond to the enemy because what the enemy wants to do is make me afraid. And if I become afraid, I'm going to make fearful decisions. And some of us, the problem with your discernment is that your discernment is hijacked by your emotions. And so Nehemiah knew enough. I need to approach the word of God and God's throne with emotional sobriety. And so what he says is I have to be responsible for my emotions. The reason why you can't hear, the reason why you don't know what to do is because your emotions are all out of whack. And that's why they teach you, whether it's anger, whether it's whatever the emotion is, you must be responsible for your emotions. If I ask you right now, I said, hey, describe to me the moment in time where you made a horrible decision. I can wait. And you know what happened? Most of us will describe a moment in time where we made a decision and it was accompanied by fear, guilt, shame, anger, impatience, and you can keep on going. 
Because here's the thing. When you're not emotionally sober, your emotional your, your emotions hijack the decision-making part of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex in your mind, in your brain, where it makes the decisions, what happens is when you are emotional and you're high on your emotions, it causes everything to paralyze. Paralysis now forces you to make dumb decisions. Uh, 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 you can research it. When you are emotional, when you are upset, when you are angry, you literally lose IQ points. So this is why when you're trying to function in discernment, I can't, I can't see straight when I'm upset. I can't think straight when I, when I have an attitude. I need to take a step back. Nehemiah in the text said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to y'all because if I listen to the gossip, the gossip's going to make me angry and then I'm going to get petty. You can't be petty and have great discernment. He says, you know what? I'm going to take a step back because you want me to be afraid. And if I become afraid, that's what he said. He says, then I'm going to sin. Nehemiah knew that if you, if you, if I get upset, it's going to get ugly. And so he knew he had to be responsible for his emotion, somebody you cannot have bad emotional hygiene and good discernment. I'm I'm gonna say it one more time, and I need you to type this, put this in your notes. I cannot have bad emotional hygiene and expect to also have good discernment. You need to be more responsible with your emotions. And that's what they, the devil knows this very well. That's why he wanted Nehemiah to get upset and be afraid because if he's upset, then he won't hear God straight and then he's going to make a mistake. Take a step back. Understand what you're thinking. Understand what you're feeling. There is a, a perceived lie that you're telling yourself, a perceived loss. And, and so you have to know the difference between the perceived loss and the real loss, what's actually going to be lost. Because many times you're not losing what you think you're going to lose. And it's not what you see happen is not really happening. But, but, but you're looking through a wounded lens. You're looking through an angry lens. Take a step back. Expose the lie. Apply the truth. Let me help you. Let me help you. All right, so not just bad emotional hygiene. And I'm almost finished. Somebody type your access points. Your access points, your access points. What do you mean access points? In order to truly be able to embrace what God did in the life of Nehemiah and everybody in Jerusalem, rebuild the walls in 52 days? How is that possible? How is it possible? He guarded his access points. Because when you look at chapter four, somebody say Nehemiah chapter four, what ends up happening is the walls were almost to its half, half, half its size. And then when Sanballat and all the people realized that the gaps were beginning to close, what they decided to do was to send people through the gaps and through the crevices into Jerusalem so that they can filter in and infiltrate, right? People were now entering into Jerusalem who didn't belong there. People in your life that don't belong there. People in your situation that don't belong there. And so what Nehemiah said, hold on. If I'm going to do what God has called me to do, if I'm going to see straight, if I'm going to hear straight, I have to strategically put people in my life right next to the access points because I, I have to make sure that I control the flow of things and people in and out of my life. And so you have to be responsible. You have to guard your access points because you are absolutely responsible for everything that comes in and out your life. And so the Bible says in chapter in chapter four that then he he, he got some people. He got all kinds of people. And he said, I need you to guard this this breach in the wall, this gap in the wall. I need you to guard this access point, because the thing about an access point is an access point is a portal through which something or someone can engage you or influence you. And so Nehemiah knew enough. I can't fully make great decisions. I can't fully operate in discernment. I can't see well if I allow people to infiltrate and enter into my life and begin to access me. The problem with you is too many have too many people have access to you. 
Too much information can access your ears. Too much sound and, and too much visuals can access your eyes. Too many things are, are too close for you to touch. Too many things have access to you, and as a result of what has access to your ears, it begins to influence your heart. Because you have too many things that can reach and touch you, the misinformation, the gossip, because of this, you can't see straight. I can't think straight. I, what, what is God? You've been asking God the same question for 10 years. The problem isn't that God isn't speaking. The problem is too many things and too many people have access to you. Nehemiah understood, I must guard the most sensitive areas of my life because what the word that God is trying to give to me is precious. And what God is trying to do in my life, I have to make sure that I have trusted people in my life guarding areas that need to be guarded because there's some seasons where you let people have access to you. But in sowing seasons and in harvest seasons, you gotta be careful of the things and the people that ask somebody say, God didn't send that. Nehemiah knew, knew enough. And I'm gonna leave you with this one. I'm gonna leave you with this one. Nehemiah knew enough to know that God didn't send that. How do you know God didn't send that? Look, I'm, I'm responsible with my emotions. I'm in God's word. I don't just allow anybody around me. I don't care how good you look. I don't care how much money you're trying to give me. If God didn't send it, I don't want it. Which leads me to my last point. What can help you in your discernment is God's presence. Did you? Did you think I was going to forget about God's presence? Did you think that I was going to forget about God's presence? Or you think it's a give me? Oh, mm -mm. You don't want to substitute just because I read God's word doesn't mean that I bask in God's presence. Huh? When you look at the text, Nehemiah chapter 1, and I bid you a good day. When Nehemiah discovered that his family was in trouble, he had to make a critical decision. Oh, listen. He started praying. And the Bible says he started fasting. <laughs> but the Bible also teaches us that he started fasting in the month of Kislev. The month of Kislev is November, December. But when you look at chapter 2, when he goes to the king, and the king says, what's wrong with you? He, speak, he begins to tell him everything that's wrong. And he begins to reveal that he'd been fasting. But this was now the month of Nisan, which is now March and April. My brother, my sister, <laughs> Nehemiah had been fasting for four months. He had been fasting and in God's presence for four long months. See, we want the beauty, we want the glory, but we don't know the whole story. Before he ever went to, to Jerusalem, before he ever fought with the adversary, he had been in God's presence. And because he was in God's presence and God's word was in God's in, in him and, and God's presence, he was in God's presence because of this. He was able to discern when God was moving and when God wasn't moving. What are you saying? Because he was in God's presence. Don't miss this. Don't don't do not miss this. When someone came to him, I don't care because you're talking about church. I don't care where I met you. I don't care what you're saying. When you're in God's presence, like Nehemiah, he was, uh, he was able to discern wasn't, what wasn't of God's presence. What are you saying? If you are not in God's presence, you won't be able to determine what's not of God's presence. Do you need any more oil? Listen, he spent time in God's presence. If you want to know if it's a counterfeit, the easiest way to discover whether or not I need, is God in it? Nehemiah said, if God ain't there, I ain't going. If God's not in it, I don't want it. If God isn't breathing on it, I can do without it. Hey, Nehemiah, let's go into the temple. 
I don't care where you tell me to go. Is God there? And if God isn't breathing there, guess what? I ain't going there. If God isn't breathing on him, I'm sorry, sweetheart. You need to let him go. If God is not tell, if God is not there, bro, you can't force God's presence on the situation. If God is not there, then you might not need to be there yourself. Nehemiah looks at Shemaiah, the prophet, and says, <clears throat> I discern that God did not speak to him. Yeah, although he was prophesying to me, he was prophesying and uttering words that Tobias and Sanballat had gave him. Are y'all listening to me? If you want to know if God is speaking and God is moving, the easiest way is to rest in God's presence. Because if you're in God's presence, you will be able to determine if he or she or it is of God's presence. But if you don't want, if you don't have time to be in God's presence and to just bask in God's presence, how do you possibly expect to be able to discern if God is in it? There is no hack to God's presence. There is no easy one, two, three to a miracle. Your obedience will activate every answer you ever wanted. Let me pray with you. God, we bless you. We bless you today for this word. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, we thank you for Nehemiah. God, this isn't a fancy word. This is a word that requires us to be sober because, God, there's things we're asking you for and all you're asking in return is us. You just want us. You will give us whatever we desire if we can just give you ourselves. Today, God, every single person who is under the sound of my voice, whether live or replay, it is my prayer that we stop, that we pause. And that, God, we recognize your holiness and that, God, would, whether it's a relationship, whether it's marriage, God, whether it's a job opportunity, whether it's moving and transporting to a new city, God, whatever it is, answer it if we give you us. I pray, God, today, not only for good ears to hear your word, but help us to be obedient because although we know what to do, we don't have the wherewithal to be obedient with what we know. So help us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people everywhere typed, amen, exclamation point, exclamation point. God didn't send that. Go on, get in God's presence. Talk to you soon.